Welcome to the Better Together podcast, where we look for ways we can work together to advance the cause of Jesus Christ among Free Will Baptists. Today we have with us Dr. Stanley Outlaw. He was a professor at Welch College, then Free Will Baptist Bible College, for over 32 years, but he's also served as a pastor for many years. He's pastored more than 12 churches. Uh, he's also served as an interim pastor for more than for at least four churches. So. This is a man who's taught and trained a lot of pastors, but he's also uh, been involved in pastoring churches all through those years. So, Dr. Outlaw, thank you for your ministry, and thank you for taking the time to join us today. It's a privilege to be able to do that. Well, you know, pastors, we're going through a lot these days. It's difficult to pastor at any point, as you know. Uh, we've also had COVID, and you know what that's like to pastor through COVID. You're pastoring even now. Why don't you Plus share? Plus, I had COVID. <laughs> and you had COVID. And when you had COVID, we were, yeah, it was kind of yeah. worrisome for a couple of yeah. days there, too, wasn't it? When not, not too bad. I spent a couple of days in the hospital. Yeah. Uh, because I'd had a little mini stroke along with it. Yes. Which sometimes goes with COVID, but uh, thankfully, no permanent damage. This is good. And and I will say, you're looking good, you're sounding good, and uh, gotten right back into the swing of things, we might say. But what we wanted to, you to do today is share with us some maybe advice. And I know people hate to say, well, I don't want to really give advice, but really, you've taught and done quite a bit. I think what you have to share would be helpful to many of us if you'd be willing to do that. What kinds of things would you suggest for us today? Well, I'm going to use a list uh, from a sermon that I preached at the Southern Quarterly Meeting a couple of three weeks ago, and uh, I'll mention the things that I mentioned there. The title of the sermon was Perseverance, mm -hmm. and I've got an idea why they wanted me to preach on perseverance. After all, I'm 81, and so whatever else I've done, I've persevered, and I'm He's still not around, quit. still in the ministry. But I'll just uh, use uh, the third, third point in that sermon, Perseverance mm -hmm. and Service, and uh, I'll mention I have eight things here, and Brother Eddie can... I'll mention them, and Brother Eddie can ask me questions about them if he wishes to. Mm. Number one, uh, be sure to know what God's will is for your life. Preach some, pray a lot. Uh, there ought to be a yearning to preach. You remember Paul said, Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Mm -hmm. He indicated that he preached the gospel under constraint. Uh, very important, seek the counsel of older and wiser men and women. Uh, I want to tell a little story uh, about a fellow who unfortunately didn't follow this advice. Uh, he wasn't too qualified to preach. And I've heard of few preachers like this myself. Yes. That, uh, I wondered... Did God call them? Maybe there's some other purpose other than their preaching ministry. Mm -hmm. And so this one fellow, uh, the uh, uh, young man heard him, and the uh, fellow was telling about how he knew God had called him to preach. He was out uh, in the field plowing, and and he saw a sky rider. You've seen airplanes sometimes do sky riding. And he saw this sky rider, and it said GP. <laughs> and so he interpreted that as go preach. <laughs> and then after the young man heard him, though, a time or two, he th thought that he misinterpreted the GP, that it meant go plow <laughs> yeah. instead of go preach. But uh, certainly a fellow ought not to jump into the ministry. Yeah. He ought to do all these things that I've suggested and perhaps some other things. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember as a young man when I was examining the call to preach, and a lot of like a lot of young men, uh, it would have been nice to have something written in the sky or something like that. But God doesn't normally do that, mm -hmm. and so I I think I did all of those things that I suggested and concluded. Uh, I, I think I I wanted to preach. Right, preachers ought to want to preach. That's one of the main things. 
you should go through those other things too, especially consulting with older and wiser men. Mm-hmm. And and it's a requirement that you be able to preach. That's kind of what you're alluding to, right. so that someone would be able to take the scripture and explain the essence of it. Right. And right. and it sounds like you're saying that one guy, no, he needed to keep plowing. And I have heard a few <laughs> along that line that. I, I, I'm not going to argue because God may have called a fellow to preach like that who couldn't preach very well, but maybe he was just an excellent pastor. Mm-hmm. And the pastor, pastoring aspect is, is just as important as the preaching. But God, I think, wants us to be able to preach mm-hmm. if we're going to be preachers. So to be a good preacher, it really requires preparation, getting yeah. ready for it. So how is it that... Pastor, how is it that uh, a man called the preach can get himself ready and prepare for that? Well, I'll just I'll just go back to my calling when I was about eighteen, mm-hmm. and uh, I my plan was to go to Troy State University in Alabama and uh, become a teacher in the public school, and and uh, pastor the small churches that were available down in South Alabama, where I came from. But God impressed me through uh, the Bible College Quartet came through. I remember Dr. Pickerley was a member of that quartet. Um, uh, Jack Paramore and Randy Cox, uh, Lavelle Sawyer, Bill Gardner were part of that team. And I'd never heard a quartet sing like that. They sang a cappella. And their harmony was so good, but their testimonies were more important. Mm. They testified they they were students themselves at the time. And I was impressed. uh, And I think that's one of the things that uh, drew me to Pregel Baptist Bible College in Nashville, Tennessee. I'd never been past Birmingham. Mm. And so to me, going to Nashville was almost going into Yankee territory. (laughs) And uh, But God impressed me that... I needed to change my plans. Mm. I was, uh, I went two years to uh, Troy State in Alabama, and then I came to the Bible College. Uh, the first fellow that met me with his hand out was a man named Dwight Riggs. Uh, he was Ken Riggs' uncle, mm. and uh, I still remember that. And it, the campus was so small in contrast to Troy State that at first I was a little disappointed. Mm. But I hadn't been there long before I thought I'd gone to heaven. And those two years were wonderful, and I think it's made all the difference in the world as far as my training is concerned. And then I went on to Bob Jones University uh, for three more years and did my dissertation, got my Ph.D. in New Testament interpretation. Mm. And so uh, God can use people who don't go on, I suppose. I I know he's using a a lot of people among us. Uh, You can get educated in different ways, Uh, but it's a lot quicker when you go to college. Mm -hmm. So I would recommend to every young man who's contemplating the ministry that he especially consider Free Will Baptist Bible College or now Welch College in Gallatin, Tennessee, Because I guarantee you it will make all the world a difference in your ministry. And I'm sure Brother Eddie can say the same thing because he went through somewhat of a similar pattern. Absolutely. And so you've got a curriculum and you just it's just different when you have a curriculum, when you have a program of study. Uh, where you've got certain classes, where you have certain objectives that you must be able to accomplish. Uh, you were one of my professors, you remember, and so you had to know this much about New Testament survey, this much about languages and so forth. And what you're saying is you, it's hard to get that uh, piecemeal, if you exactly. will. Exactly, exactly. And I've, I've known some uh, preachers in our denomination who were well-educated but not formally, mm-hmm. and and they've worked hard at it. So yes. it, it's not that you can't do it that way, but uh, I don't recommend it because it's a much longer road, and there's a lot of things you probably won't get uh, uh, than if you went to 
uh, formal training and especially training within our own denomination if that's where you're going to minister. Absolutely. And so you, you're getting your training. Uh, most guys are married. And so really the ministry is not just a guy going and preaching. You mentioned earlier pastoring, but also his wife's got a role in it as well, doesn't she? In fact, that's very important. That, that's a key and if you're not already married, keep that in mind as a qualification for a girlfriend Yes, leading up to marriage. Now, if you're already married, and I know of a situation or two of this nature where God didn't call the wife, evidently. He called the man, and it caused problems. Uh, so I can't stress how important the uh, preacher's wife and and First uh, Timothy three certainly acknowledges that in the qualifications for a pastor. Mm -hmm. Those aren't qualifications for a preacher there per se. They're qualifications for a pastor. Mm -hmm. And so a guy's not married yet. Really think that through. Be real careful. You are married. You got to take care of your wife. Exactly. You got to make sure she's okay. She, now, she's at least half of your ministry, maybe more. Yes. Now, the message you preached on a couple of weeks ago, I remember you talked about you got to be careful to avoid any inappropriate involvement uh, with the opposite sex. In other words, uh, uh, you got to protect yourself if you're in the ministry, don't you? You certainly do. And it, I'm sure everybody that's listening to this knows some preacher whose ministry has been ruined by an inappropriate relationship with a, with a woman mm -hmm. uh, other than his wife. And so I can't stress how important that is. Sometimes people will say, well, don't you think it's going to an extreme if you, if you say, well, I'm not going to meet with a woman by myself. No, I don't think that's an extreme. You need to at least have a secretary outside the door or if it, if it needs to be a private conversation, uh, any, any length you can go to to prevent ruining your ministry through the, uh, this situation uh, is not too extreme. Mm -hmm. And it's got a de terribly detrimental effect on a church yes. when this happens. So you thinking about it, the impact it has upon you personally, your family, and the church, the, the gospel going forward. So that's what you're saying. You've got to really protect yourself. In some cases, it almost destroys the church. And I think there's probably been some cases where it split the church. Mm -hmm. And the church never was the same after that. Yeah, it's a tough thing. Now, Today, sometimes people will give advice to pastors and say, you can't befriend the people in your church. Uh, be careful about getting too close to them, uh, them seeing you as a regular person, so to speak. Sounds like you're thinking that's not great advice. I've, I've heard some pastors say that that was their policy, mm -hmm. that they, they just didn't socialize or did not become friends. I would agree with this. You have to be very careful about being treating everyone equally in your church. Mm -hmm. uh, you will naturally be closer to some families and some people than other people. That's just human nature. Uh, but uh, be careful that you uh, are, are treating everybody the same. Mm -hmm. if, if people in your congregation get the idea that you have special people that you treat differently than you do them, then your pastorate most likely won't last too long at that congregation. So, uh, but, but I believe you ought to be friends. Be friends with everybody mm -hmm. in, in your congregation. Let them think of you as one of, one of their best friends. Mm -hmm. And so I disagree with the idea, don't become friends with your congregation. Become friends with all of them. Mm. Some you'll be a little closer to than others. And that's sometimes hard to learn in school. Uh, that, that's part of our what we've got to work on, our personality, to be with folks, to spend time with them, to yeah. befriend them. That's true. Now, <clears throat> the ministry is not, not easy. And that's part of what you stress is you've got to persevere. Right. We're going to have some difficulties, aren't we? Yes. The, uh, uh, there's no such thing as a preacher who doesn't have 
hard times at times. Uh, the times we live in creates a mm. situation uh, with the morality, people's idea of morality is so different than what, what I grew up with. I grew up uh, in a pretty immoral society. People say, well, boy, it's bad today. Well, it's always been bad ever since the fall of Adam. Uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, uh, Paul says. And so we live in a world of sinners, but sometimes it seems sin is more outrageous and more perverted and uh, different than it has been in other eras. And the, the society becomes more tolerant of sin. And so I think in that sense, we probably live in a worse day uh, today as a pastor at 81, uh, in contrast to when I was a pastor at 18, uh, we, we face a different society. It's a different situation. How do you keep going? How do you keep from getting so discouraged as you're trying to minister in these difficult times? Well, I, I think the fellowship of your church congregation, but also fellowship of fellow preachers is important. Mm. I think we can encourage one another. Uh, before COVID came about here in the Southern Quarterly Meeting of the Cumberland Association, we had had a preacher's meeting. It's been difficult to get it started back again, but I think a lot of us preachers still got together some, and so preachers can encourage one another better than almost anybody else because we know what a preacher's going through. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one way to try to keep from getting depressed. Don't be a loner. Mm -hmm. uh, have, have friends. Have friends in your congregation. Have other friends outside your congregation. And have, have preacher friends especially to help encourage one another. And then don't quit. You're talking about someone that started preaching at 18, now at 81. How in the world can we keep from quitting? Well, the old advice that I've heard for many years, and I think it's still good advice, is as a pastor, never resign on Monday morning. Yes, yes. Uh, because uh, it, it'll probably be better by Wednesday, whatever, whatever problem it is that's making you think about resigning. So, uh, so I would encourage uh, preachers, uh, just because you're facing difficulty, uh, the, the old saying is, the pastor's greener on the other side. Mm -hmm. Well, it may be and it may not be. It, may, it most likely is the same old pastor. And so you've got to be careful about that. Uh, make sure when you're considering resigning or moving to another church that, that it's time. Mm. I think I think there there is a time when when you do need to move and just all kind of things come into making that decision, but don't make it speedily. Make it uh, after you prayed about it, after you've talked with other preacher friends, especially. Uh, make sure it's the right thing to do. And I know you've talked about Lincoln a bit and how effective he was as a president, what kinds of things he accomplished. Um, and I believe you might have even mentioned what if he had quit in the midst of all well, that difficulty. One of the impressive things, and I've used this illustration before, when you read how many times Lincoln ran for political office, I think it was probably eight or ten times. And he was elected one time and served two years and then was defeated. But he, most of the time he was defeated again and again and again but he kept running until uh, 1860, was it? 1861, yeah. that he became the president during the, perhaps the toughest time in the United States of America during the Civil War. And God blessed him. I, I believe Lincoln might have been a Christian. There's some evidence that he, he read the Bible and advised people to read the Bible. But he certainly had a good head on his shoulders. Mm. And uh, so he's a good example of a fellow who didn't quit. And he kept on until he reached the highest office in the land as far as political office is concerned. Not quite as high as being a preacher, I don't think. But. <laughs> well, and then but look at how he was able to keep the union together. Of course, a lot of efforts involved in that. But not quitting sure did right. lend itself to some fruit.
right. and helped out quite a bit. A lot of people today talk about retirement. <clears throat> they look forward to retirement. It doesn't sound like you've really retired. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> there, there have been uh, – I uh, pastored Woodbine Free Will Baptist Church, and so it's an interesting process – uh, I first took Woodbine on a part-time basis, and I was still full-time at Free Will Baptist Bible College. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I went to, I think, half and half. And then finally, in the last maybe three years of my 10 years at Woodbine, I uh, resigned at the Bible College as far as full-time, and I pastored the church full-time and did my best to work with the people there. And God, God blessed in a lot of ways. And I enjoyed that ministry. Uh, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed teaching at Free Will Baptist Bible College. It, it was one of the greatest privileges of my life. But I also have enjoyed pastoring. Mm -hmm. I think pastoring was a, a marvelous outlet. I think it made me a better teacher. And so I think God blessed in that respect. And so you were able to kind of carve your time out sometime in this part of the world, sometime in the other part of the world. It sounds like they fed off each other. In other words, it helped you be a better professor and I think so. And probably a better pastor studying the kinds of things you were studying. I would recommend. Can you think of ways that so called regular pastors, somebody listening in on this, how can they imitate that is there ways they can apply those that same kind of lesson in their own lives well uh, i think that they their ministry needs to be varied mm -hmm. i think in in the case of a minister who is a full-time minister supported of course some we have a lot of pastors who who have to work by vocational we call them and so that that gives them a of balance as far as doing that. And I think sometimes uh, we, we say our goal is to get a fellow where he's a full-time pastor, and that's fine. I think that probably is true in most cases, but in some cases when you're trying to build a church, having a secular job may open the doors of bringing some people into your church. Yes. And, and uh, most of all, I think a fellow needs to have a balance. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't have a, another job uh, that you have to balance, you, you ought to have a hobby of some sort. Uh, don't become obsessed with a hobby and put more time in the hobby than you do in your pastorate. But I think everybody needs a little variety. Mm. Uh, I think a fellow is, is mentally and emotionally more healthy when he has some variety as far as his life is concerned. That's great. And so, like, look at your life, look at your qualities, the, the spiritual gifts you have, talents. And it sounds like you're saying try to use those. Yes. Sometimes it's in secular work. It could be in mentoring or right. coaching someone along. But it sounds like you're saying stay involved and use that right. the best you can. And it will make you a better preacher. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And a better pastor. That's great. Well, you have given us a lot to think about, Dr. Outlaw. I wonder if you have any parting thoughts or any other ideas you want to share with us before we sign off today. Let me just quickly run through these suggestions that I made, and I think we've mentioned most of them. Uh, but just in case we've left something out, the second one was make appropriate preparation for service. We talked about that. I talked about the wife, mm -hmm. uh, take every precaution to avoid inappropriate involvement or even the appearance of involvement with the opposite sex. Make an effort to love your people. Ex expect that there will be difficulties. Don't let an apparent lack of success or a feeling of failure stop you. And then finally, when you feel it's time to retire from your full-time ministry, become an active working part of a good local church. That's good. And... Uh, I have done that in between pastoring. I've, uh, when, when Brother Roy Harris became, uh, succeeded me at Woodbine in uh, 2001, I believe, uh, I stayed there uh, with Roy's approval uh, for a year or two. But again, if you're a preacher, you get the itch to preach. And uh, so uh, Cornerstone Church asked me to come and preach. 
And, and I was glad to do that, and I stayed there 10 years. And uh, then same, same process, after I felt like it was time to leave there, I went to Cane Ridge Church for a while, and then Richland asked if I could help them. And so I think this is about three years of helping them out. Wow. So uh, I, don't think, I don't think there's anything wrong with a preacher deciding to retire mm. and, uh, and not pastor other churches. A, a lot of preachers do, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you do become an active part of the church, get in church, get involved, and be an active working part of whatever church you're going to. That's great. Well, hey, good job, Dr. Outlaw. Thank you well, for sharing with us today, my friend. Privilege to be able to talk to you, Brother Eddie, and thank you for this invitation. Well, you're welcome, and we want to also thank our listeners. Thank you for listening in today. You probably have thought of some folks that might benefit from this podcast. Please take it and share it. Remember, everything we do for the for Jesus Christ is good, and so we want to work better together to advance his gospel. Thank you for joining us today.